Chapter 12, Political Elements. The periodic table reflects our frustrations and failures in every human field, economics, psychology, the arts, and, as Gandhi and the story of iodine prove, politics. As well as a scientific one, there's a social history of the elements, too. That history can best be traced through Europe, starting in the country that we now know as Poland. Polish politics. Poland did not exist when one of the most famous Poles ever, Maria Sklodowska, was born in Warsaw in 1867 at the same time Mendeleev was constructing his great tables. Four years earlier, the Russians had taken control of Warsaw after the Polish people attempted to gain independence. Russia had backward views on educating women, so the girl's father tutored her himself. She was particularly interested in and good at science, but she also joined some political groups that wanted independence for Poland. After demonstrating too often against the wrong people, Sklodowska had to move to Poland's other great cultural center, Krakow. Even there, she could not get the scientific training she wanted. She finally moved to the Sorbonne in faraway Paris. She planned to return to her homeland after she earned a Ph.D., but having fallen in love with Pierre Curie, she decided to stay in France. In the 1890s, Marie and Pierre Curie began perhaps the most fruitful partnership in science history. Studying radioactive elements, those with unstable nuclei, was the new field of the day, and Marie's work on uranium, the heaviest natural element, was brilliant. The Curies shared the 1903 Nobel Prize in Physics for their work with radioactivity and uranium. Throughout the time that she was in France, Marie never stopped viewing herself as Polish. Indeed, Curie was an early example of a species whose population exploded during the 20th century, the refugee scientist. Science, like any other human activity, has always been filled with politics, and the 20th century is full of examples of politics and empires warping science. Scientists often buried their heads in lab work and hoped that the world around them would figure out its problems as neatly as their equations. A mistake. Not long after winning the Nobel Prize, Curie made another discovery. After performing experiments to purify uranium, she noticed that the leftover waste, which she normally had simply thrown away, was 300 times more radioactive than uranium. Hopeful that the waste contained an unknown element, she and her husband began boiling down thousands of pounds of pitchblende, a uranium oil, in a, a uranium ore, in a cauldron, and stirring it with an iron rod almost as big as myself, she later said. It took years of tedious work, and all they got was a few grams of the residue to study. But from those few grams, they discovered two new elements. In 1911, she won another Nobel Prize, this time in chemistry. As discoverers of the new elements, the Curies earned the right to name them, and Marie called the first element they isolated polonium, from Polonia, the Latin for Poland, after her homeland. No element had been named for a political cause before, and Marie hoped that her choice would help the Polish struggle for independence. But naming her first element after Poland contributed nothing. Worse, the second element she discovered, radium, element 88, glowed an amazing green color and soon appeared in consumer products worldwide. People even drank water with radium added from radium-lined ceramic jugs called Revigators as a health tonic. Overall, radium overshadowed polonium and caused exactly the sensation that Curie had hoped for with the element named after Poland. Even worse, polonium was linked to lung cancer from cigarettes, since tobacco plants absorbed polonium excessively well and concentrated it in their leaves. Irene Joliet Curie, Marie's daughter, also suffered at the hands of polonium. A brilliant scientist herself, Irene, and her husband, Frederick Joliet Curie, picked up on Marie's work, and Irene won her own Nobel Prize in 1935. Unfortunately, one day in 1946, a capsule of polonium exploded in Irene's laboratory, and she inhaled Marie's beloved element. Jolie Curie died of leukemia in 1956, just as her mother had 22 years before. Ironically, radioactive substances have since become crucial medical tools. When swallowed in small amounts, radioactive tracers light up organs and soft tissue just as x-rays show bones 
Virtually every hospital in the world uses tracers, and a whole branch of medicine called radiology deals with them. Leftovers and tracers. In 1910, just before Marie Curie collected her second Nobel Prize for radioactivity, young Gregory Hevesy arrived in England to study radioactivity himself. His university's lab director in Manchester, Ernest Rutherford, immediately assigned Hevesy the Herculean task of separating out radioactive atoms from non-radioactive atoms inside blocks of lead. Actually, it turned out to be not Herculean, but impossible. Rutherford had assumed the radioactive atoms, known as radium D1, were a unique substance. In fact, radium D was radioactive lead and therefore could not be separated chemically. Ignorant of this, Hevesy wasted two years tediously trying to tease lead and radium D apart before giving up. Hevesy, a bald, droopy-checked, mustached aristocrat from Hungary, also faced domestic frustrations. Hevesy was far from home and used to savory, used to savory Hungarian, Hungarian food, not the English cooking at his boarding house. After noticing patterns in the meals served there, Hevesy grew suspicious that, like a high school cafeteria recycling Monday's hamburgers into Thursday's beef chili, his landlady's fresh daily meat was anything but. When confronted, she denied this, so Hevesy decided to seek proof. Miraculously, he'd achieved a breakthrough in the lab around that time. He still couldn't separate radium D, but he realized he could flip that to his advantage. He began musing over the possibility of injecting minute quantities of dissolved lead into a living creature and then tracing the element's path, since a creature would metabolize the radioactive and non-radioactive lead the same way, and the radium D would emit beacons of radioactivity as it moved. <coughs> If this worked, he could actually track molecules inside veins and organs, an unprecedented degree of resolution. Before he tried this on a living being, Hefsi decided to test his idea on the tissue of a non-living being, a test with an ulterior motive. He took too much meat at dinner one night and, when the landlady's back was turned, sprinkled hot lead over it. She gathered his leftovers as normal, and the next day Hevesy brought home a new fangled radiation detector from his lab buddy, Hans Geiger. Sure enough, when he waved it over the night's goulash, Geiger counters, Geiger's counter went furious. Click, 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 click. Hevesy confronted his landlady with the evidence. But, being a scientific romantic, Hevesy no doubt laid it on thick as he explained the mysteries of radioactivity. In fact, the landlady was so charmed to be caught so cleverly with the latest tools of forensic science, she didn't even get mad. There's no historical record of whether she altered her menu, however. Chemistry versus Physics In the 1920s, chemistry and physics were battling with each other, and most scientists picked sides. And at that time, Niels Bohr, a famous physicist, unwittingly opened the crack between chemistry and physics into a real political rift. In 1922, the box for element 72 on the periodic table was blank. Chemists had figured out that the elements between 57, lanthanum, and 71, lutetium, were all rare earths, but nobody was sure about element 72. According to the story, Niels Bohr in Copenhagen came up with a plan for hunting the element based on the new science of quantum mechanics. The key point, said Bohr, was that element 72 was not a rare earth, but a proper transition metal. Bohr therefore asked Hevesy, who had moved to Copenhagen after his tracer's discovery helped his career blossom, and physicist Dick Koster to look at samples of zirconium, element 40, the element above number 72 on the table, and probably its closest chemical relation. In perhaps the easiest discovery in periodic table history, Hevesy and Koster found element 72 on their first attempt. They named it Hafnium, from Hafnia, the Latin name for Copenhagen. That's the story, anyway, but the truth is a little different. At least three scientists before Bohr wrote papers dating as far back as 1895 that linked element 72 to transition metals such as zirconium. It seemed that Bohr had poached their arguments. Yet, as with most legends, what's important isn't necessarily the truth, but how, but rather how people react to a story. 
people clearly wanted to believe that Bohr had found hafnium through quantum mechanics, i.e. physics alone, and not through chemistry. Some people even proclaimed that Mendelevian chemistry was dead and Bohrian physics ruled. What started as a scientific argument became a political dispute about territory and boundaries. Such is science, such is life. Colleagues had already nominated Hevsey for a Nobel Prize by 1924 for discovering hafnium, but there was a dispute with George Urban, a French chemist, over who had found hafnium first. Most scientists didn't find Urban's work convincing, and in 1924 Europe was still divided by World War I. The dispute became the French versus Bohr and Hevsey, who were considered Germans by the French, even though they were Danish and Hungarian, respectively. Chemists also mistrusted Hevsey for his dual citizenship in chemistry and physics, and that, along with the political brink, brink, oh, and that, along with the political bickering, prevented the Nobel Committee from giving him the prize. Instead, it left the 1924 prize blank. Despite the injustice, Hevsey continued to work with others, including Irene Joliet Curie. In fact. Hevsey was a witness to an enormous mistake by Joliet Curie, one that prevented her from making one of the great scientific discoveries of the 20th century. That honor fell to another woman, an Austrian Jew who, like Hevsey, left Germany to get away from the Nazis. Unfortunately, Lisa Meitner's run-in with politics, both worldly and scientific, ended rather worse than Hevsey's. Credit where it's due. Meitner and Otto Hahn began working together in Germany just before the discovery of Element 91. Its discoverer, Polish chemist Kazimierz Fajans, had found only very short-lived atoms of the element in 1913, so he named it Brevium, meaning brief. Meitner and Hahn realized that most atoms of Element 91 actually hung around for hundreds of thousands of years, which made Brevium sound a little stupid. They renamed it protactinium, or parent of actinium, the element it eventually turned into. No doubt Fajans protested this rejection of his name, but regardless, Brevium lost out, protactinium stuck, and Meitner and Hahn sometimes receive credit for co-discovering element 91 today. However, that's not quite the end of the story of protactinium. Meitner and Hahn continued to work closely together. He performed the chemistry, identifying what elements were present in radioactive samples, and she performed the physics, figuring out how Hahn had gotten what he said. Unusually, though, Meitner performed all the work for the final protactinium experiments because Hahn was distracted with research for Germany's gas warfare during World War I. She nevertheless made sure he received credit. Remember that favor. After the war, they resumed their partnership, but while the decades between the wars were thrilling in Germany scientifically, they proved scary politically. Hahn, strong-jawed, mustache of good German stock, had nothing to fear from the Nazi takeover in 1933. Yet to his credit, when Hitler quickly ran all the Jewish scientists out of the country, Hahn resigned his professorship in protest. For her part, even though she had Jewish grandparents, Meitner downplayed the danger and buried herself in scintillating new discoveries in nuclear physics. The biggest of those discoveries came in 1934, when Enrico Fermi announced that by pelting uranium atoms with atomic particles, he had created the first artificial elements heavier than uranium. This wasn't true, but people were so excited by the idea that the periodic table was no longer limited to just 92 elements that new ideas about nuclear physics kept scientists around the world busy. That same year, Irene Joliet Curie did similar experiments. After a careful chemical analysis, she announced that the new heavy elements were similar to lanthanum, the first rare earth. This was unexpected, so unexpected that Hahn didn't believe it. He politely told Frederick Joliet Curie that the lanthanum link was hogwash and that he would redo Irene's experiments to prove it. Also in 1938, because of her Jewish roots, Meitner was forced to leave Germany. She found refuge in Sweden. Hahn remained faithful to Meitner, and the two continued to write each other and even met occasionally in Copenhagen. During one such meeting in late 1938, Hahn arrived a little shaken. After repeating Irene Jolie Joliet Curie's experiments, he had found her elements, and they not only behaved like lanthanum and another nearby element she'd found, 
barium, but according to every known chemical test, they were lanth lanthanum and barium, element 56. He was confused. Meitner wasn't confused. She alone, after discussions with her nephew and new partner, physicist Otto Frisch, realized that Fermi hadn't discovered new elements. He'd discovered nuclear fission. He'd split uranium into smaller elements and misunderstood his result. The Eka lanthanum Joliet Curie had found was nothing more than plain lanthanum. Hevsey realized that Joliet Curie had been so close to making that unimaginable discovery, but Joliet Curie, Hevsey said, didn't trust herself enough to believe what she had seen. Meitner trusted herself, and she convinced Hahn that everyone else was wrong. Naturally, Hahn wanted to publish these amazing results, but his connection to Meitner made doing so politically tricky. They discussed options, and Meitner agreed to name just Hahn and his assistant on the key paper. Meitner and Frisch's contributions, which made sense of everything, appeared later in a separate journal. The Nobel Committee had decided by 1943 to reward nuclear fission with a prize. The question was, who discovered it? Hahn, clearly... But the war had isolated Sweden and made it impossible to interview scientists about Meitner's contributions, an important part of the committee's decision. The committee therefore relied on scientific journals, which arrived months late or not at all, and many of which, especially the German ones, had left Meitner out of the discussion altogether. Also, the divisions between chemistry and physics made it hard to reward work that combined the two sciences. Hahn's supporters pointed out that Meitner had done no work of great importance, in the previous few years, hardly surprising, since at the time she was hiding from Hitler. Meitner's biggest supporter on the Nobel Committee argued for a shared prize, and probably would have gotten what he wanted, but when he died unexpectedly, Hahn was awarded the 1944 prize alone. Shamefully. When Hahn got word of his win, he didn't speak up for Meitner, and as a result, Meitner got nothing, largely because of politics. The committee could have made up for this horrible oversight in 1946 or later after the historical record made Meitner's contributions clear, but the Nobel Committee is not enthusiastic about admitting mistakes. Despite being repeatedly nominated her whole life, Meitner died in 1968 without her Nobel Prize. Happily, history has a funny way of correcting such things. Element 105 was originally named ha Hanium after Otto Hahn, by Glenn Seaborg, Albert Gorioso, and others in 1970. But during the dispute over naming rights, an international committee stripped the element of that name in 1997, calling it Dubnium instead. Because of the odd rules for naming elements, basically each name gets only one shot, Hanium can never be considered as a name for a new element in the future either, so the Nobel Prize is all Han got. However, Meitner soon got a far more exclusive honor than a prize given out yearly. Element 109 is now, and forever will be, known as Meitnerium.